with over 300 episodes in the bank. Every once in a while, I'd like to step back and look into the archives and re-air an older episode. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast with Rebecca Larson. Today, I am very pleased to welcome back to the show, Dr. Linda Porter. Now, you probably know Dr. Porter best from multiple podcasts that she's on, maybe some TV appearances that she's made, but she is also a brilliant historian and author. Today, Dr. Porter is here to talk to us about Catherine Parr. Now, we all thought we knew who Catherine Parr was, right? Yeah, we didn't really know. Dr. Porter did such a great job with her research to show us a side of Catherine Parr that wasn't the nursemaid that we've always been told. Dr. Porter, welcome back. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So Catherine was the sixth and last wife of Henry VIII. She married four times in all, and she's often referred to as a nursemaid, but she wasn't that, was she? No, I don't actually know how far back this uh, rather Victorian interpretation of Catherine Parr goes, but it, it may actually be Victorian, of course. And it, it has acquired a kind of life of its own. And occasionally I am irritated to find even historians who should know better nowadays still referring to it. But it, but it is just completely silly. Uh, and for reasons which if people gave it much thought, I think would occur to them spontaneously. And the, the idea that Henry VIII would have married for his last wife, some sort of mumsy woman um, who was going to crawl around on her hands and knees, dabbing at his ulcerated legs, is clearly absolutely fatuous. I mean, Henry wanted a wife. Uh, he wanted an attractive one. And more than anything else, he wanted one who might still bear him children. Because I think if Catherine had produced a little Duke of York, Henry would have been absolutely ecstatic. Of course, one was not forthcoming, although she did become pregnant in her final marriage after Henry had died. But um, for, firstly, of course, Catherine was not middle-aged. She was just short of her 31st birthday uh, when she married Henry VIII in, in July of 1543. Uh, she was therefore slightly younger than Anne Boleyn had been when she finally married Henry. Uh, she was an intelligent, attractive, um, well-read and very personable woman uh, with a warm and outgoing personality who'd been married twice before. Uh, and I think perhaps that has given rise slightly to, to the, the matron idea. But beyond that, of course, um, there are other factors Firstly, Henry wouldn't have wanted a woman nursing him. He was extremely alpha male, as we all know. And I think the idea would have horrified him. He did have male doctors, of course, two uh, at least, Dr. Wendy and Dr. Hewick. Uh, and he, he would have uh, listened to their uh, medical advice. Um, but a, a wife uh, trying to tend to him medically would have been given the shove fairly quickly, I think, and of course, queens did not go around acting as nurses to their husbands. It, it wasn't part of a, a queenly role. And I mean, if, if you even just stand back a bit and look at the kind of clothes they wore, can you possibly imagine anyone trying to, to administer sort of Tudor equivalent of first aid to a king dressed up the way that queens were. I mean, I don't think you'd have got anywhere near kneeling on the floor just for the kind of clothing that they wore. So it, it, is, it is quite ludicrous and has perhaps the only slight basis in, in some reality in that 
Catherine was perhaps as interested in most women of her background and time were in, in herbal things, uh, you know, both for cosmetics for herself. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of women as heads of household uh, had to um, have some knowledge of, of herbal remedies um, from a medicinal point of view, though some of the ones that they actually used are completely horrendous. <laughs> we wouldn't go anywhere near them nowadays. Uh, but but it was never any part of Henry VIII's a marriage proposal to Catherine Parr that she would become a kind of uh, middle-aged nurse. And indeed, she never did. Thank you for dispelling that myth for everyone. <laughs> and I want to circle back to something that you mentioned right at the beginning when you were answering that question that I think is really important for our listeners to learn about is the Victorians. Can you explain maybe why we should question the Victorians' history? Um, well, for, for one thing, they didn't have the access to the sources uh, that we do now. Uh, or at least not nearly so readily or so widespread. And, and of course, a lot of material has come to light since then. So new material on the Tudors is fairly thin on the ground now. Having said that, it, it does still crop up from time to time, often with quite interesting side effects. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, each age views the past through the prism of its own experience. And the Victorians, at least as a, uh, as a generalization as a group were very queen, keen sort of on on moral um uh, judgments and behavior now as historians we all sit in judgment on the past it's ridiculous to say that that we don't we do but i think nowadays people do historians do try and approach looking at the tudor and indeed other periods through more objective and dispassionate eyes and of course the victorian who's mostly responsible for these often inane and totally inaccurate portraits of various queens, uh, not just Catherine Parr. Uh, in fact, I can't even remember what she said about Catherine Parr, but, but the, the Victorian responsible is Agnes Strickland. And she and her sister Elizabeth produced um, huge sort of histories of the queens of England and also the queens and princesses of Scotland um, and various other terms, which have had a surprisingly long shelf life. I don't honestly think many people look at them uh, as a reliable source nowadays because the Strickland sisters had the full sort of moral superiority of um, Victorian spinster ladies, uh, plus uh, a very shaky actual grasp of history and the context of the stuff that they were actually looking at. They did um, at least apparently go into... Um, uh, original records from time to time, but I don't think they really understood what they were looking at. And they, they, they certainly didn't see the past in, in the way that, that we do now. And they were hugely critical and judgmental. Uh, I mean, there can't be too many queens in, in, in English and indeed Scottish history that Agnes Strickland had a very high opinion of. <laughs> uh, I, um, I mean, most notable of, of the character assassination she did a uh, are actually people like Mary, Queen of Scots, Margaret Tudor, and Anne of Denmark, the wife of, uh, of James VI and I. Uh, but in general, she isn't a reliable source. But of course, these things become enshrined and are quite difficult to break free of. Scholars can, but despite, I think, their best efforts over quite a long period of time, these interpretations of people in our past do become part of a, a sort of wider public consciousness of what they think, what the general public thinks happened in the past. And, and these, uh, these views of people die very hard, actually. I mean, I've spent the last 20 years of my life, and unfortunately this mantle is now being taken up by some brilliant new scholar, young scholars, you know, trying to uh, at least give a more rounded picture of the reign of, of Mary the I, um, so that it isn't just the um, Bloody Mary thing, but we also look at what actually happened in the rest of her reign. Um, similarly, it can work in other ways in that, you know, Elizabeth I has become virtually a saint for many uh, English people who probably wouldn't have liked her very much if they'd actually met her in person. Like most of the Tudors, she wasn't very nice when you got to know her. 
And, and I think one of the, the interesting things about Catherine Parr that speaks to us across the years is that I mean, she did have a, a, a fierce temper when aroused, which, which is rather interesting in itself. But she does seem to have been um, in an age of quite strong personalities, a, a genuinely warm hearted woman. I think she is um, someone we would have liked nowadays. And I, I, if, you, if you look at Henry VIII's six wives, um, admirable uh, as figures as many of them were, you know, determined, strong willed, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think I would have liked any of his wives except for um, perhaps Anne of Cleves and, and Catherine Parr. I didn't think I would have liked any of the rest of them at all. And of course, they weren't there to be liked. They couldn't have cared less whether their contemporaries or, or hit people subsequently liked them very much. Uh, that, that wasn't their raison d'etre. But I think um, it is partly due to these Victorian views of, of the past um, that Catherine Parr has been represented as some kind of rather goody-goody type um, who walked around in sort of matronly blue clothes, read a lot of books and was really under that sort of heading rather dull, whereas, of course, as we know, she was nothing of the sort. So we know she wasn't a nursemaid. One of the other things that I hear quite often is that she was a wealthy widow. Uh, Well, she was certainly a widow, but she wasn't wealthy. I mean, having said that, she wasn't poor. Uh, I think we would probably define her as being comfortably off. Her her second husband, Lord Latimer, who died in February 1543, uh, had um, left her comfortably um, off. She had property in London and in other parts of the country. Uh, She'd been given sufficient funds that she could look after um, his his daughter, Margaret Neville, um, the elder child of of Latimer's uh, first marriage. Uh, John Neville was about to go out in the world on his own at that time. And in fact, he inherited most of his father's estates. So uh, Lord Latimer had left his wife well provided for, but not rich. Not, not by Tudor standards at, at, at any um, at any rate. And then she became queen. <laughs> yes, no, not immediately. I mean, there was a gap in between. Uh, the, the other uh, thing which I think is worth dispelling as, as a popular concept about um, Catherine Parr, and this is even more common uh, nowadays than, than the matronly nursemaid thing, which is, I think, slowly dying the death, is that that Catherine married Henry VIII um, reluctantly, which she probably did, um, but, you know, with burning zeal to convert him and and continue the um, irrevocable uh, onslaught of Protestantism in the country. And there is just absolutely no evidence for this. There is no evidence that Catherine had any particular interest in new religious ideas when she married Henry VIII. Uh, and Henry would certainly not have married her if he had any thought um, that that she would uh, develop or try and influence him along those lines. And in fact, they were married in a Catholic ceremony, of course, um, by Stephen Gardner, who was one of the more reactionary of the um, conservative uh, bishops at the time in, in England. Um, at a point, of course, in his reign, when Henry was trying still to sort of balance the reforming uh, side of his advisors, both religious and political, with the more conservative one. Uh, and of course, his own religious views certainly uh, tended to conservative. He, he didn't want, uh, he had all sorts of reasons, not just Anne Boleyn for the, for the break with Rome, though she was the occasion of it. Uh, but his own religious ideas uh, tended to be conservative. I mean, it hasn't been said of him that he, he lived and died a Catholic, and it's probably true. And certainly he heard mass uh, every day of his life. And during the time that she was his queen, Catherine Parr heard mass too, because, you know, that was what they did. Uh, and that was what the, uh, the king required. Um, and she didn't demur from it, even while she was uh, perhaps becoming more exposed and interested um, to new uh, religious and reforming ideas. But her 
the impetus for this um, particular change in her outlook, uh, which certainly is underlined by her reading habits, the circle of people she drew around her and her own um, uh, religious publications eventually seems to have been the period of her regency while Henry was away fighting in France in 1544. And the, the general view, um, it, it can't be proved, but it seems probable, I, certainly it's what the historian Derma McCulloch thinks, is that probably um, she was exposed more fully to uh, ref religious reform and its implications for England uh, by uh, Archbishop Cranmer during the time that uh, she was regent and Cranmer was one of a number of people on the council that had been appointed by Henry to advise her. But the, the first of her publications, um, which is a book of uh, a sort of commentary and translation of, book of, uh, of a number of psalms, uh, is based very much on sort of medieval um, religious writings uh, and then moves perhaps more into the sort of humanist area. But it is not um, rabidly Protestant in any way. Uh, and although Catherine is often described as our first Protestant queen, queen consort, I mean, the, the term even in 1543, was known, but was not widely in use in, in England. Um, people were viewed as evangelicals or reformers, um, but they were not really fully described as Protestants until around the time of Henry VIII's death, probably at the beginning of, of Edward VI's reign. So the, um, the uh, lady with the re burning religious seal, it, it, again, there is no real evidence for this, but some evidence that she was introduced uh, to, to new religious ideas not long after she became Henry's wife. That's very interesting. And staying on the subject of religion, a lot of the listeners had said they kind of want to talk a little bit about her involvement with Anne Askew and um, the potential arrest, how that all worked out, and how did Catherine save herself? Well, Anne Askew, of course, we do know about, um, and her torture and death is horrendous, and one of many things that one can throw at the, the uh, feet of, of Henry VIII. Um, she never, as far as we know, actually met Catherine Parr, um, but she was certainly known or known of to people in, in the circle of Catherine's ladies and acquaintances who uh, um, seem to have had an interest in, in new religious ideas. And it is because of this more indirect link, and Askew has some probable bearing on what happened to Catherine in the um, spring and summer of 1546 in the last uh, year of Henry VIII's life. I mean, the, the, um, the information that she was uh, you know, targeted by um, religious conservatives and that a death warrant had even been uh, issued for her, again, has no contemporary um, historical verification. It first appears in um, John Fox's um, Acts and Monuments, which are generally known as the Book of Martyrs, uh, in, in quite a long um, uh, excerpt in which he describes all of this in, in considerable detail. Now, it, it's probably unlikely that, that Fox made it up completely. Um, he must have heard or been told something along the lines of what he eventually printed, though how much truth there is in it, we simply don't know. Again, it is thought that Cranmer might have been um, the source of, of this particular information. Uh, but the problem is by the time um, Fox published the first edition of the Acts and Monuments in 1561, everyone who had been around at the time of, of, of this supposed uh, you know, attempt uh, to remove and execute Catherine Parr was dead. Um, her sister was dead by then, her sister Anne. Cranmer was gone, of course. Catherine herself was gone. Anyone who might have known anything about it um, was no longer around. So how long this story had been circling and precisely where it originated, 
we simply don't know. It, it does make an extremely good and dramatic story. And its veracity is given, an, again, an indirect um, uh, support by the fact that clearly Catherine was spooked by something in the summer of 1546 and that her relationship with Henry VIII does seem to have um, uh, become perhaps uh, much more unpredictable at that time and that she may have felt herself threatened. Um, and the evidence we have for this, which is, is suggestive, is that she recalled her uncle, William Parr, to court during that time, um, obviously as a kind of support and advisor. He was very elderly and hadn't really wanted to come back. Uh, and that um, there is evidence that she uh, got rid of quite a lot of books that were perhaps uh, viewed as, as um, heretical or might have been viewed as heretical by religious conservatives. Um, but uh, and that Henry does seem to have cooled in his attitude towards her. But that is really all that we can be absolutely certain of. It, 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 there probably was a cooling in the royal marriage. I mean, up until that time, he had showered her with um, almost everything um, that, that, she, that she could have wanted. Uh, certainly, if they had discussed religious matters between them, um, he would perhaps have become progressively irritated by it. It's also quite probable that he was only really alerted to his wife's both both his wife's position as a writer uh, and also what the breadth and depth of her interests in religious matters were when, of course, Elizabeth, uh, his daughter, famously um, gave him a uh, a copy of um, uh, some of uh, the, the work that Catherine had translated um, uh, in uh, herself, translating it into various European languages as a uh, Christmas and New Year's gift to her father at the end of 1545. And this does seem to have brought home to Henry that perhaps he should pay a bit more attention to what his wife was doing. I have never myself been able to believe um, that she was able to, to write and actually publish without his knowledge. And that, that strikes me as really quite extraordinary. But it may be that he had sort of thought, oh, yes, yes, dear, you know, this is the kind of thing, if it makes you happy, just get on with it. Until he he had it sort of presented to him in, in a multilingual, um, though beautifully within a beautifully embroidered cover, cover by his daughter. Uh, whereupon he may have decided that perhaps this merited, his wife's interest merited a closer examination on his part. You have also to remember, I think, that by the spring and summer of 1546, Henry was extremely unwell. He was in his, what would prove to be his last illness. Um, he was uh, fitful, unpredictable, uh, and probably really quite dangerous uh, by that stage. So that... Um, if he had um, begun to harbour reservations and perhaps even resentment uh, against his wife, because Henry wasn't the sort of uh, man who would have liked to have been upstaged by a, a, a wife who was publishing what, by the standards of the time, were becoming bestsellers, you know, on, on religious ideas. I don't think he would have liked that very much at all. Uh, and uh, it, it is possible that he... Um, undertook rather spitefully a course of action, which he subsequently perhaps regretted at the last minute, uh, in order to frighten her and bring her into line. But again, that, that, is, that is speculation. Uh, what is certain is that um, uh, eventually this rift in the royal marriage was healed. Um, they went on an autumn progress hunting together, he um, continued to, to uh, shower her, her with new jewellery, with new dresses and ordered almost anything that she wanted she, she could have. But uh, any kind of influence she might have had over him until that stage um, was simply not there in the, in the last months of their marriage. And of course, she wasn't with him on his deathbed, though <clears throat> that would have been unusual if she had, you know, again, people... Royalty didn't attend each other's deathbeds uh, in, in those days. And that was true for most of Europe, not, not just England and the British Isles. Uh, and uh, she passed 
the last Christmas of their marriage at Greenwich with Mary, um, her stepdaughter. Elizabeth and Edward were uh, away in, in Hartford Castle at the time. They were not in London at all. And though Catherine appears to have returned to Whitehall in January, where Henry was at the time and where he died, uh, it, it's, she doesn't appear to have been able to see him. We can only assume that she would have asked to, but that she was told to keep her distance, basically. So that is probably what happened to, towards the end of the marriage. I mean, before that, it had been basically a, a happy and, and positive union for, for both parties, and particularly for the royal children who benefited greatly by um, Catherine's renewed interest in their situation and in um, making them part of the family. I'd love to talk about her role as stepmother because she was a pretty great stepmother, wasn't she? She was, yes. I mean, she, she'd had plenty of practice. Uh, I, I mean, again, I, this is often given as a reason why Henry must have married her, but it, you know, Henry was not the sort of paterfamilias who cared very much about, I mean, he, he did care about the, the uh, uh, fortunes of his children and the way they were treated. And although Catherine is often credited with um, bringing, with the developments which brought both Mary and Elizabeth back into the succession, it, it seems likely that having recovered from the ghastly debacle of his marriage to Catherine Howard, Henry had begun to think along these lines himself. And he brought um, Mary back to court already and spent a great deal of money on building a new um, lodgings and apartments for her in, in Whitehall. Uh, and and uh, he, of course, had, had supervised from a distance his son's education, though Edward was not brought up um, uh, living with his father. Ro royal children didn't live with their parents anywhere in, in, in Europe at that time. Um, it would have been considered odd. And anyhow, a, a court was really no, no place for children. So uh, Catherine's background as a stepmother may have been something that Henry sort of was vaguely aware of, but the idea that he went around looking for uh, a sixth wife, someone who had good credentials as a stepmother, is about as ludicrous as the idea that he wanted to marry someone who could deal with his ulcerated legs. Uh, but nevertheless, Catherine did perhaps seize on his uh, renewed interest uh, with the children of his various marriages. And also, I think, perhaps saw in them a, a way to um, keep herself uh, front and centre in the king's mind as well. You know, a, a woman taking an interest in his children, um, which was uh, to be welcomed, so long as it wasn't oppressive, uh, would, would have been something he welcomed. And they also, in turn, you know, if, if this worked out positively, which it did, would help reinforce Catherine's own position. So, so I think there were, I, I think it was um, done partly because she had a lot of experience as, as a stepmother and was much loved by um, her, her stepdaughter, um, perhaps less so by her stepson. She wrote various things in her, in her, her final uh, book, The Lamentations of a Sinner, which indicate that, that her stepson had been a troublesome teenager, but then there's nothing new under the sun in that, of course. Uh, so, uh, yes, she was a very caring stepmother. I, I mean, the, the years of her marriage to Henry were probably, I, I think, um, aside from her, the earlier time of her childhood, the, the um, happiest years of Mary, the first life. Because here was a woman um, of about the same age, Catherine was only four years older than her, uh, who shared many of her interests. They both loved the latest clothes, they loved jewels, they loved music and dancing. Uh, this was clearly a relationship that was likely to prosper. And of course, Catherine um, uh, made sure that the children all had their portraits painted. Um, there hadn't been any portraits painted of them for, for quite a long time. So um, Mary was painted, Elizabeth was, and, and Edward as well. And these were all things that you know, could be shown to their father, uh, and which would also help establish their role um, within um, the, the English royal family. Uh, and the children seem to have been very fond of her. Um, certainly, if you think of Edward, aside from his, his elder sister, Mary, 
uh, with whom he had spent a lot of time as a child. Uh, Catherine Parr was the only mother that, that Edward ever knew. Uh, and I think his, his, his little letters to her, are, they're rather sort of stiff and formal in some ways, but behind them you can almost hear the child who is very pleased to have this affectionate lady interested in his welfare and education and upbringing uh, in, in his life because Henry had been married too briefly to any of his other stepmothers for him to get to know them, really. Uh, and Elizabeth, of course, um, seems to have used Catherine as a role model. Um, uh, particularly, I think she was interested in uh, how Catherine handled her, her regency and, and essentially how she handled herself as queen. And uh, of course, when Elizabeth went to live with Catherine after Henry VIII's death, uh, Catherine was also responsible for overseeing um, Elizabeth's education, though Elizabeth had a good education up until that point anyhow, but um, she had much more say, did Elizabeth, in, in who she could choose as a tutor. And uh, Catherine certainly played, I think, a, a crucial part in, 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 in shaping this young woman. Uh, and some of the uh, gratitude which uh, Elizabeth exhibited for that subsequently it is, it's very typical of Elizabeth because it, it's it's not necessarily glaringly obvious, um, but it, you can see it in the people that she supported. Uh, I mean, most notably in William Parton, Marquess of Northampton, who was Catherine's brother, uh, who was uh, an advisor to Elizabeth and who, having fallen on some harder times himself, Elizabeth actually paid for his funeral or part of the funeral costs. And of course, Elizabeth, um, I know you don't want to talk about this, but I will mention it in passing. Elizabeth also supported Thomas Seymour's servants during her reign um, uh, and uh, uh, clearly felt gratitude to them uh, for, for the role that they had, had played um, in uh, you know, the period of her life after her father's death and before her sister became queen as, as Mary I. So I, I think Catherine, as a stepmother to the royal children, is a, a crucial part both of their lives and of her approach to queenship. You know, you had said a little bit earlier that Catherine had returned to Whitehall in January and Henry VIII died on January 28th. I'm curious, is there any truth to the statement that she thought she would be named regent? Yes, there is. Uh, or at least, uh, again, th there is suggestive evidence. Uh, in the um, National Archives at Kew, there uh, are a couple of documents um, signed by Catherine as Queen Regent. The uh, problem is they're not dated. So although they could have come from the earlier period of her re regency, one appears to uh, refer to um, uh, land ownership uh, and uh, other things which would have been of concern to her immediately around the time of, 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 um, of Henry's death. So that there is some direct indirect evidence, but there's nothing that can conclusively prove it. Uh, I think it's highly probable that she did at least for quite a while, harbour the hope that she might be named as regent because she had been previously. Uh, but it was in rather different circumstances. And of course, I think Henry would have thought um, that his son would need the guidance of men rather than a woman, no matter how much affection he might have held for that particular woman. Uh, and of course, she was not a blood relative. Whether had she actually been Edward's mother, uh, Catherine would have been appointed as regent is, is a question, good question. It's one that we'll, we'll never really know the answer to. So, so yes, there, there is, is some slight evidence that she may have been preparing um, for the role of regent. And of course, the, there was that gap after Henry VIII had actually died and before his death was announced in which Somerset um, and other uh, of the leading politicians wanted to make sure that everything was in order um, before Somerset was announced as protector. But as the king's uncle and a blood relative, he did have a much stronger claim to be, re well, what in effect was regent than, than Catherine Parr did. I think she was probably very disappointed 
Um, whether it actually came at the time as a surprise or not, we don't really know. I have so many questions in so many different directions. I went to go because her life is just so fascinating to me. And, and I know I said I didn't want to talk about Elizabeth because when you do, it just turns into this big snowball and it detracts yes, from, I know. <laughs> from everything else. But I, I do. I think I'm going to go there because I, I want your take. Do you believe Kat Ashley's representation of Catherine Parr? Well, to be honest, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, she'd had occasion to know Catherine Parr over a period of time. Um she might also have resented um, Elizabeth's off obvious affection um, for her, her stepmother. Uh, I mean, th there are other representations of, of, of Catherine Parr by uh, other people. Uh, and I mean, there is quite a lot that you can tell about the woman in, in her own writings uh, and also in, in um, the reaction of Mary and Edward to, to, to Catherine and indeed Henry himself. Um, but I, I think Kat Ashley is a, an interesting woman. Um, she, she was obviously disconcerted um, and indeed in, in extremely frightened to be arrested, which is hardly surprising, which of us wouldn't have been. Um, but I, I to be honest, <clears throat> I've never given it a great deal of thought. Um, it, it's really her her representation of Seymour that I find more interesting and probably less persuasive. Um, but I know that that, that that is linked, obviously, with her, her representation of Catherine Parr. I mean, what we do know for sure <clears throat> about Elizabeth and her period of time in the Parr-Seymour household is that it, it seems to have been a, a largely happy one, that something must have happened or a, an accumulation of things might have happened um, to cause uh, Elizabeth to be removed from the household towards yeah. the end of Catherine Parr's pregnancy. Though what that is precisely, I don't think we'll ever know. This <laughs> did not go with... Um, uh, Catherine to Sudley. Um, Lady Jane Grey did, but Elizabeth didn't. Um, but um, one can draw all kinds of false conclusions from this. Uh, I, I'm not sure I fully believe Kat Ashley's depositions on almost anything because I mean, she, she was in many respects a foolish woman. <laughs> I, I just want, there's so many questions surrounding Elizabeth in that household that I feel like we will never have the truth. We'll never know for certain what occurred other than we know Elizabeth left Hanworth. Yes, yeah, she did. Um, to, to go um, into Cheshire to, yeah. to, to, to join actually Kath Ashley's sister um, there and, and her husband. She subsequently wrote, um, uh, we don't know whether she wrote subsequently to Catherine, she certainly wrote subsequently to Seymour, a letter which seems perfectly normal and is even very friendly. Um, so I, I again, I, I don't think, you, you know, but of course, by that time, um, uh, at that time, uh, certainly there was nothing particularly untoward. I mean, whether... Elizabeth's removal was remarked upon by other people at the time. We we don't really know. There, there isn't any evidence that it was. It was only after Catherine's death, and particularly when Seymour was arrested, that that um, the these um, stories came to light. Um, and I mean, if you want my view, um, which I'll give you anyhow, <laughs> I, I don't think there's any smoke without fire. I do think it is quite wrong, um, though we all do it to judge the past on present day standards. Um, and it is, it is curious that, that you know, the, the series of episodes, which I have to say, I mean, probably give people fits, but as a teenager, I thought, I would have thought if it had happened to me, it was rather exciting. But, and I don't think I was a peculiar teenager, but perhaps I was. Um, Elizabeth was not used to having a strong male figure in her life. I mean, she, she knew her father slightly, but not very well. Um, and, and of course, there was a, a rushed 
of people to dissociate themselves from Seymour after he was arrested, um, which is not widely known, incidentally, though I do mention it in my book on Catherine Parr. Um, he had some perhaps unfortunate um, associates, and I think there may still be some things to uh, come out. Uh, but in general, um, I, I think that, that that we don't know enough about um, uh, the latter stages of uh, Elizabeth in Catherine's household. But what we do know um, is that uh, if this was traumatic, she never seems to have harboured a grudge against any of the people involved. And I think that that perhaps speaks more than um, than Kat Ashley's ramblings in the Tower of London. I couldn't agree more with you. As you were talking about that, I was I was thinking and wondering if there has ever been any evidence found that maybe tells us that Elizabeth wasn't allowed to go to Sudley with Catherine Parr. No, we, we haven't found that. No, I, I don't know of anything um, to that sort. Uh, I, I mean, Jane Grey was also, of course, a ward of Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. Oh. Uh, and seems to, again, have held both of them in a great deal of affection and was obviously perfectly happy to to go uh, with her, w- with Catherine to, to Sudley. But I I don't know whether Elizabeth was, was stopped from going or not. I think by the time she'd moved to live with the Dennys in Hertfordshire, it probably was a, a permanent move. Um, she might have wanted to see both Catherine and Seymour again subsequently, but she did not do so, in fact. In her letter, I guess, to Catherine Parr, seems like she's sorry she had to leave. Yes. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it is a letter which, uh, which has, you know, a tone of regret to it. Though perhaps beyond that, it's a bit difficult um, to read precisely what she meant by it, of course. But, um, I mean, she does sign herself Your Highness's Humble Daughter, of course. I've, I've actually got the, the letter here in front of me. Oh, perfect. Although I could not be plentiful in giving thanks for the manifold kindness received at Your Highness' hand at my departure, yet I am something to be borne with all, for truly I was replete with sorrow to depart from Your Highness, especially leaving you undoubtful of health. And albeit I answered little, I weighed it more deeper when you said you would warn me of all evils that you should hear of me. Now, that that is an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. For if your grace had not a good opinion of me, you would not have offered friendship to me that way that all men judge the contrary. But what more may I more say than God, than thank God for providing with such friends to me, desiring God to enrich me with their long life and give me grace to be in heart no less thankful to receive it there. And I am glad in writing to show it. And and I, yes, I mean, that one sentence is is quite (laughs) curious. I mean, what it was that Elizabeth thought that men might have heard of her. Right. And it works with the whole story of, you know, finding her in Thomas's arms and, it, it does, yes, um, but it could mean other things. I mean, it's just very hard to say. I mean, and clearly there had been, as I said, either an event or a culmination of events in which it was decided that Elizabeth should should go elsewhere, uh, and she did. But there is also uh, a lot of warmth in that letter, and uh, and uh, you know, a, a statement that she will never forget. The um, kindness and, and affection that, that had been shown to her. So whether it is a slight letter of apology or not, I don't know. I mean, the, the other aspect, which perhaps hasn't been adequately explored, is that there is some evidence that Catherine really was quite ill during her pregnancy, that she may have suffered from um, rather bad morning sickness. Uh, and certainly um, it, it seems to have been r- rather difficult. She may just have found um having uh, someone lively in her household a bit uh, and, and perhaps whose behavior she couldn't fully um, answer for uh, a bit difficult at, at that point in time because of course <laughs> Jane Grey was not living with her um, so so it wasn't as if she had several children under her roof uh, she, she didn't but I I I mean it is capable of being t- interpreted in in a number of ways uh, but as I said, I think the most crucial way is that Elizabeth seems to have retained throughout her life 
an affection for Catherine Parr uh, and for those who had been in the Parr Seymour household. And perhaps what's interesting in this respect is that that certainly Elizabeth had had a, a, a close and cordial relationship with Mary, her sister, well into Edward's reign. There's a, a letter again undated, but probably around 1551 in which it's obvious that the sisters corresponded quite frequently, that they even exchanged servants, which wasn't so unusual in those days, and that Elizabeth knew a great deal about the hapless Mary's gynecological problems with her periods. And I mean, that is not the kind of thing you would know if you weren't on close terms with someone. (laughs) Uh, At least I wouldn't have thought so, particularly in that day and age. Uh, And um, subsequently, of course, um, the relationship with Mary and Elizabeth did break down. Um, Well, I suppose it could be argued, well, Mary was still alive and the other people um, from the Edwardian period were dead by then. Uh, But certainly Elizabeth did not live out the rest of her life and her reign with a uh, rosy or affectionate picture of her elder sister. Uh, Whereas she did, I I think, for the for the years that, that she had spent with Catherine Parr. I've just realized that we need to have another episode where we can finish talking about <laughs> everything else because we have come to the end of this episode. And I think what I would like the final question to be for you, Dr. Porter, is what do you believe Catherine Parr's greatest contribution to English history was? I'm, no, I'm quiet for a moment because, to be honest, I'm it's probably the first time I've, I've, I've ever thought about it. Well, I, I suppose you would have to say that um, she was the first Queen of England and one of the earliest women, not the earliest by any means, but one of the earliest to, to be published in her own right and in her own name. Um, and as such, you know, she was an inspiration to many and her books were still in 17th century terms, selling well and widely read well into into the next century. They aren't read nowadays, of course, except by um, scholars uh, and people writing about her life. Uh, And, you know, perhaps they are not not to modern tastes, but I I think that is a a huge achievement. Uh, And the fact that she did um, play a crucial part in in the development of, of a woman viewed as one of England's greatest monarchs. I mean, even views of Elizabeth are not perhaps quite as hagiographic as they used to be. Uh, uh, And that is right, in my view. But uh, I I think it is the the combination of her personal achievements um, uh, as as a writer uh, and uh, her interest in religious reform, and also the the positive influence that she, she had had as her stepdaughter, uh, and the fact that she uh, appears to have been uh, a genuinely pleasant woman, um, not liked by her um, formidable sister-in-law, by the way, of course. Um, you could do in a whole broadcast on Anne Stanhope, I should think, but uh, <laughs> um, not that I th- I don't know that much about her, actually. Uh, and, and again, she's another of these people that is vilified as a sort of horrible um, virago, um, which may merely be that she was a rather strong-willed woman. Uh, but I, I think Catherine is the is the most um, accessible, isn't the right word, because that sounds like a library book or something, but perhaps to the modern world, the most approachable of, of Henry's queens, someone that we might like if we had known her. Uh, and I do think it is therefore unfortunate that, that this, this whole sort of 20th century preoccupation with um uh, you know what might or what might have might not have happened um, between Seymour and Elizabeth has has tended to to colour that um, because I mean we have no right to, to judge people in the past um, when we don't really have the full story. I suppose you never do really, but it it. I, I have to say, just on a closing note, um, Rebecca, that I find the interest of of quite a lot of people and particularly in some of these um uh, facebook tudor groups um 
the, the interest in the Tudors and sex quite prurient. You, you know, you see, I've been asked a lot of questions in the past on Tudor um, Facebook groups. You know, did I think that, that Catherine Parr actually had sex with Henry VIII? Well, oddly enough, I don't spend my entire life wondering this sort of thing. And I'm a bit worried about people who do. Uh, but but it, it's just... Um, there is so much more to all of these people and so much more interest in the times that they lived. Why do we have to um, put onto them this 21st century obsession with sex? I, I, I just find it genuinely distasteful. And I think on that note, I, <laughs> it will probably upset numerous of your readers, but they perhaps should think about it. Right. You know, if I was asked, you know, to, to, to if I was to ask myself questions about Catherine Parr, I would not be immediately asking, do I think she had sex with Henry VIII? <laughs> that wouldn't be your first question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Linda Porter, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your wealth of knowledge on Catherine Parr with us. You're most welcome. And I, I mean, I hope it, it, it does inspire some interest and some people to perhaps think a little bit more broadly than within the bedroom. And hopefully we've done that today. Yes, I hope so. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 